Hey everyone, this is Nick, and forgive the weird crackly voice if you can hear it, because, yeah, I'm sick, it's the usual end of summer dreaded man flu thing, so... Anyway, this week we have Linux Mint Debian Edition 6 being released. We have Photoshop on the web, which might be a good thing for future Linux desktop adoption. And we have some more updates about the Cosmic desktop environment. And we also have the usual GNOME and Plasma 6 news, and we also have some updates to the open source NVIDIA drivers, and we also have this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare. They offer a range of solutions to ensure that your Linux fleet stays up to date, secure, and with minimal downtime, thanks to kernel live patching and extended lifecycle support. And this week, they're offering you another free guide. If you're using CentOS, you're probably aware that it is end of life for version 8, and nearing the same state for CentOS 7, and you might be looking at what you could migrate to. And so Tuxcare has a free guide to help you migrate to Alma Linux. It's free of charge, it's community driven, and it's supported financially by Tuxcare. And it is, of course, based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. In the guide, you will get step-by-step -step instructions to migrate to Alma Linux, and some details on the enterprise-grade support you might need, and other tools you can use to automate maintenance. So head over to the link in the description of the video and download your free guide. Okay, so Linux Mint Debian Edition 6 is now officially out, after a very short beta period. It's based on Debian 12 Bookworm, with a very nice set of updates to all the packages in the repos, compared to Linux Mint Debian Edition 5, and maybe even compared to Linux Mint 21.2, which is based on Ubuntu 22.04. So the new version of LMDE offers the same version of the Cinnamon desktop as the regular Linux Mint based on Ubuntu, as it's still some sort of side project to offer a solid base in case Ubuntu disappeared, or for people who really don't want the Ubuntu base at all. The system requirements are the same, unsurprisingly, as the regular edition of Mint, and you can download the new ISO from Mint's website. You can also upgrade directly from LMDE5 to 6 by running sudo apt update, then sudo apt install mint upgrade, then running the whole new graphical upgrade tool that Mint added to its recent versions. Like they say, it's a major update and it can take a long while to apply, so don't start that at the beginning of the workday, I guess. Unless you want to have a good excuse to not actually work. If Windows users can use that it's updating excuse, then maybe us Linux users also should. Now, Photoshop on the web launched this week, after two years in beta, limited to a few customers and countries the whole time. Why am I talking about this here? Well, it's because Photoshop is probably the tool people mention the most when listing what's missing on Linux for them to switch. So having a web version of that tool is definitely a good thing for Linux in general. Unfortunately, this is not the full Photoshop experience. While it does come with a bunch of Photoshop's core tools, including generative fill and expand, the ability to remove the background, or spot healing and layers, it still lacks a few things, like the pen tool, the patch tool, or smart object support. Adobe says they're coming soon, so it looks like they want to expand the feature set of the app on the web, but they're not here for now. Now, this web version still requires a Creative Cloud subscription. It is not a free-to-play Photoshop, but this at least gives an option for people who just need the basics of Photoshop and don't want to use Windows or Mac OS. It integrates with a Creative Cloud account to keep editing files on the web after starting them locally. And I really hope Adobe will bring the full version of Photoshop to the web. If you think about it, it would actually be better for them and for their customers, because you could use Photoshop from any device and they would only have one version to maintain instead of a Windows version and a macOS version, which don't really integrate with the system very well anyways on any of these platforms. Now, we also got some more details about Cosmic, the Pop! OS desktop environment. Apparently, the Cosmic team now uses it daily, which might indicate it's relatively close to seeing a first beta for people to try out. So first, they have worked on Swap Mode, which lets you select a tiled window by holding Super plus X, 
and then moving that tiled window with the arrow keys to swap its position with another tiled window. This should bring more keyboard interaction in the auto tiling mode, which is pretty cool. Text inputs and search fields have now been implemented in Cosmic as well, complete with symbolic icons that match the accent color and styling the user has set. Touchpad gesture support has also been added, allowing for pinch to zoom or navigating the desktop using a touchpad or a touchscreen. The dock and panel now have settings as well, with the ability to change their own screen position to adjust the size, the opacity, the margins, the light or dark mode of each panel individually, and they both have auto-hide if you want that as well. You will also be able to hide or show various applets from the top panel. And this paints a nice picture of something really simple looking and simple to use, but with plenty of customization options to really have the layout that you want. And it also alleviates my fears that it would just be like a rewrite of GNOME Plus extensions. It does look sufficiently different and it does look like it's gonna have enough features to justify being a separate desktop environment. And in other DE news, on the Plasma 6 front, the devs merged the overview and the desktop grid effect in a single effect, which decidedly looks very macOS mission control-like. There's only one set of touchpad gestures or one keyboard shortcut to get to all your virtual desktops and open windows. It looks pretty good and it should get you the same kind of workflow as the GNOME activities view, which is really good. They also added a camera indicator in the system tray in the Wayland session, and they added shadows to floating panels. Pop-ups from floating panels, like for example when you click on a notification tray icon, will also float now, complete with rounded corners. And so floating panels are now the default on Plasma 6. There was also a lot of work to clarify some options, to port some settings panels to a newer style, and they fixed 127 bugs. As per GNOME, the System Monitor app is now ported to GTK4, and there's a new app called Ticket Booth that lets you track a watch list of TV shows and movies with all the latest info on them, using TMDB as the backend. There's also a new app called Snoop, which lets you search through your file's contents, and it can integrate with Nautilus, so you can start a search from a folder. And there are also updates to a lot of GNOME apps like Parabolic, Flat Seal, Login Manager Settings, Upscaler, Eyedropper, Bavarde, and a lot more apps. So basically a big focus on the desktop itself on the KDE side and a big focus on the apps on the GNOME side. Always nice to see. Now we have some news about the open source NVIDIA Vulkan driver, NVK, this week, with more work planned to land in Mesa 23.3, notably pipeline caching support. This is important to improve gaming performance and to reduce in-game stutters due to shader compilation. This should combine nicely with the recent work on the Nuvo drivers that enables reclocking on recent NVIDIA GPUs, and the combination of the two should start to provide a decent experience for people who really want an open source driver, even though this still won't make that stack competitive with the proprietary driver yet. And still on drivers, Mesa 23.2.1 was released this week with a bunch of improvements to most open source graphics drivers. Ray tracing support is now enabled by default for AMD GPUs, at least for RDNA 2 and 3 architectures, the recent Rust ICL OpenCL implementation should now work much better, which hopefully means DaVinci Resolve might be easier to run on AMD GPUs in the future. There's a much better Zinc driver to provide OpenGL capabilities to Vulkan-only devices, and there's also the new OpenGL driver from Asahi Linux to support the integrated GPU of Apple Silicon. There's H.265 decoding for Intel through Vulkan, and the usual bunch of Vulkan extensions added, including a few that should make gaming on Linux even smoother. And it's always nice to see some good driver updates for Linux. Now, as always, you should wait for your distro to package that new version to enjoy these benefits, or you could use a third-party repo if you want, but do that at your own risk. Now, single board computer fans, you can rejoice as the Raspberry Pi 5 is now announced, and it looks pretty damn powerful for what it is. It follows in the footsteps of the Pi 4, which was released four years ago, and it's stated to be two to three times faster than its predecessor. 
What's also interesting is that it's using its own CPU designed specifically for it. It's based on a Broadcom ARM platform with four cores running at 2.4 GHz, coupled with a Video Core 7 GPU capable of 4K60 decoding, plus 4 or 8 gigs of RAM. The Pi 5 now also supports power over Ethernet and it has Wi-Fi AC and Bluetooth 5. And in terms of new I.O., it has two micro HDMI ports that support up to 4K60 and HDR. It's available for pre-order at relatively affordable prices, 60 US dollars for the 4 gigs model and 80 US dollars for the 8 gig. And these things are really starting to look pretty decent for day-to-day -day computing. I know some people already used a Raspberry Pi as their daily computer, but honestly, looking at the results online and how smooth and fast it was, I would say it's not usable for day-to-day -day use for most people, but this one really looks like it might be. And let's finish the video with the gaming news. First, there's a nice tool called Tux Clocker with its first 1.0 release. What this thing does is let you overclock your NVIDIA GPU on Linux with a nice cute based graphical interface. It lets you change the fan speed and fan mode, it lets you change the memory clock, the core clock and the power limit to eke every bit of performance out of your GPU. AMD and Intel GPUs aren't supported yet, but they should come later. And the tool supports NVIDIA GTX 600 and later, and it also comes with a DBus API, so other tools could make use of that as well. Now we also have Wine 8.17 this week, with a new version of VKD3D that better supports DirectX 12 games. Now, note that this is Wine's implementation of the DirectX 12 to Vulkan translation layer. It is generally less up-to-date than the one shipped in Proton. They also merged their initial window management code for Wayland, and Wine also got improved support for the Direct Music API. There were also 19 bug fixes, including for Oblivion, for CMU, Dwarf Fortress, or ReCore. And Steam VR is finally getting some love with Steam VR 2.0, which has a big improvement to the whole interface. You can already try it by opting into the Steam client beta and the Steam VR beta as well. This new update includes features from the Steam Deck, including an interface that looks like modern Steam, integration of Steam Chat and Voice Chat, and a better store that puts the focus on VR games. And this sort of seems to confirm that one of the new recently leaked devices, at least their code names were leaked, uh, at least one of these two is linked to VR because you wouldn't do a complete upgrade to the whole VR stack if your plan was to just keep selling the relatively outdated Valve Index and not release anything else. It's just not worth the investment. So yeah, maybe we're gonna see something really cool from Valve and linked to VR, which I would love to try because I finally have a PC in my living room powerful enough to play VR games. So yeah, excited for that. And also excited about our sponsor. Tuxedo makes computers that ship with Linux pre-installed. They pick the hardware specifically for its Linux compatibility. And in their testing, if they encounter any issues or driver problems, they submit patches upstream so everyone can benefit. They have a wide range of devices that should cover virtually every price point and every need, whether you're looking for an affordable laptop to a high-powered workstation, something for gaming, anything in between, they have it. All the devices have a lot of choices for components, for keyboard layouts, you can have your own logo on the lid of your laptop, change the super key, it's really configurable. All the laptops can be opened, repaired and upgraded, including the RAM, the SSD, the battery and sometimes even the wireless card. And Tuxedo is based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world. So if you need a new computer and you want to run Linux on it, and you also want to support a company that actually contributes to Linux development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a Tuxedo PC. Okay, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. There's that like button, subscribe button, that notification bell, the comment section, whatever helps push this video through YouTube's weird algorithm. And if you didn't like the video, you can also click that thumbs down button and let me know why in the comments. 
And if you really like the channel and you want to support it, I left plenty of links in the description of the video to do just that from LibraPay, Patreon, YouTube, whatever. Everything is there, you know what to do. So, thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!